So my name is Jonathan Lundy. I'm an operations manager at LifeRay, working primarily on um, the cloud team. First off, though, um, so far Italy has been incredible. Thanks for your hospitality. Last night, this was my dinner and some of the best pizza I've, I've ever had, so thank you. Um, my time at LifeRay has uh, been broad. I've worked on a, a lot of different departments from engineering, uh, developer relations, uh, product management, uh, operations, and security. One of my, my last projects was to build out uh, an information security program for uh, the, the LifeRay cloud team. And that program uh, was uh, successfully uh, accomplished the ISO 27001 and SOC 2 certifications last year. And um, I wanted to share with you today kind of our, our growth path and, and what we learned from uh, building out this program and some ways that you could potentially take this to um, improve the, the security first culture at, at your own organization. Before we get into anything, I want to ask uh, the obvious question of why we should care about security. There's a lot of priorities that uh, you're facing in your organization. I'm sure even today at uh, sitting in this room at this conference, you have a lot of things on your mind. You have releases coming up and um, an ever shifting market. You have competitors hunting you down from behind, um, trying to evolve faster than you are. You have dynamics and drama inside your company you're trying to manage. And at the midst of all this, you can get lost. There can be so many priorities that you don't know exactly where you should focus, right? And with these priorities, should security be a focus? I mean, is that really, does that come above the other things? If it does, why? A lot of times security is kind of this silent actor in the background. Um, it doesn't make a lot of noise until something goes wrong. In a, in a study from, from IBM, um, just last year, there was over 6,500 uh, publicly disclosed, not regardless of the, the ones that weren't publicly disclosed, uh, data compromising events in 2018 with over 5 billion sensitive records disclosed. That's almost the population of the entire world. In 2018, almost everyone was affected by a data breach, theoretically. If we look at the top 10 uh, data breaches of all time, I'm sure these are, these are uh, very big names. I'm sure you've heard of many of these. Yahoo, one of the biggest, 3 billion uh, people affected in 2013. First American Bank, Facebook, Yahoo again. I guess they didn't fully learn from the first time. Uh, Marriott Hotel, uh, Friend Finder, MySpace, um, Equifax, Capital One, and Heartland. So we, we see a lot of numbers about total impacted people or records, but what does this cost? For example, uh, Equifax, um, they reported that the incident they, they went through in 2013 cost their company $1.4 billion. A lot of that coming from a broken trust between them and their clients and an ongoing loss of business from that. But I know what you're probably thinking, okay, uh, but I'm not Equifax. I'm, you know, at uh, a local company. I'm, I'm not a, a huge global player, so this doesn't affect me that much. If, even if a data breach happened to me, which I'm sure I'm not a target, uh, it wouldn't be that detrimental to my business. But I want to challenge that. I, I don't know if that's, uh, if we can be 100% confident with that logic. So let's take a look at a few more numbers. In the last five years, from the same study from IBM, the cost of incidents is going up by 12% and I'm sure it will keep going. On average, there's 25,000 records disclosed in each breach with about a cost of $150 per breach. So that brings the average cost per incident to $4 million. That's a, that's a global average, $4 million. Are you sure you're exempt? That's a lot of money. And that can also increase based on a, a myriad of factors. For example, certain industries uh, pay a much higher cost. Healthcare, for example, almost double the cost because of the sensitivity of, of their data. Also, depending on the, the country or region, this can, this can increase uh, majorly. If you're also wondering, okay, I'm a, I'm a small company. Let's say you're coming from a small company. Um, 
you're you're not exempt because even though the the price of the cost of the uh, incident is increasing based on the size, it makes sense. Bigger company, more to lose, right? But the problem is when we look at the cost per employee, which is a good indicator of kind of the impact uh, to the company. For the smaller companies, 500 and below, it's almost $5,000 um, $5, per employee cost of, of a data breach. This is completely different. If we go up to the $25,000, it's only like $200 per employee. That's some major risk. And the true risk is that you, uh, one in every four, uh, or 27% um, of companies will be, will be uh, part of a data breach within the next two years. As you look around, there's about four seats each row. Each one of you in each row will probably be subject to a data breach in the next two years. And that's not, I'm not making up those numbers. That's, that's, uh, this is studied across uh, global thousands of companies. So the real question is not why should you care about security, but what are you doing to prevent this? And this causes a dilemma because if, your mind, if you're taking this seriously and your mind is starting to think about how you could prevent this, you're probably going to your infrastructure, your, your servers, your, your data center, whatever, and you're thinking, we need to lock this down immediately. The problem is, or actually, if you lock it down and you want to hide under a rock and wait for the, the storm to pass, whatever the natural disaster is, the hacker, and just wait it out. The problem with waiting, though, is that that can cost you innovation and change and moving forward. We have a lot of examples of companies that haven't moved forward. Xerox, for example. Oh, it's good. Xerox, they invented the first personal computer, but they didn't believe in the internet and what communication between person, uh, person to person would mean to the world. And so they focused on what was working at the time, printers and fax machines. Kodak, a leader in the photography industry, was dominating the market for film. And once things started going digital, they created the first digital camera, but they were worried about it cannibalizing their, their film products. And so they, they cut engineering and, and, uh, and just focused on that. And then Nikon, Canon, Sony, all these other companies came in and dominated the market. Blockbuster, I don't know how common it is here, but especially in America, this was a huge, this was the way you consumed uh, rental videos and, uh, and games. They were everywhere. You could, anywhere you drove, you could find them. But they also didn't believe in the future of streaming and, and how computerization would go into the consumer's homes. And so they relied on their brick and mortar stores. And now there's, I think there's one left. Um, they're just a shadow of, of what they were. And, that, and so you don't want to be in that place where you're holding on to the past and not moving forward. So that's really our dilemma. How do we innovate? without introducing undue security risks. I think the solution comes in our security programs. And not just any security program, but having a holistic mindset to the way we build our security programs. There's five goals that I wanna cover with you today. Uh, this is taken from our own experience, what we learned uh, from going through this process, and I think can be little tidbits that are helpful uh, taking into your own organization. The first goal is to share responsibility. People are the core of our organization. Without people, you don't have an engineering team, you don't have an HR department, you don't have a sales force, you don't have anything. You remove the people and the, and the, the company is gone. And while, the, while those people are your biggest asset, actually, uh, so it's not just the internal people actually, you also need to think of even the external, your partnerships, your vendors, your customers, your uh, community. Those all factor into the collective that makes up your organization and your initiatives. But even though they are your biggest asset, they're also your biggest risk. Let's just take a scenario, for example. We have a, like a business analyst that's researching security and realizing that this is very important to his organization. He notices that, um, or he, he, this is his first attempt to make, bring about change in his organization. So it's a bank, he works for uh, Acme Bank, and he discovers that one of the main applications that the bank uses to interact with their, their customers uh, is not using proper encryption. 
And this is a, a huge concern to him. So he goes to someone he knows, engineering team. He says, hey, I know you can do magical things. Can you make this happen? Can you add encryption uh, in the proper way? And although the engineer could do it, uh, unfortunately, he's not that powerful. He's just a, an engineer, right? He doesn't have the autonomy to start running his own sprints, to run his own initiatives. So it was kind of a failed attempt, but he's, he's not giving up. He then thinks, what if I bring about an awareness to the problem? And hopefully that will bring a collective around the solution. So he offers a talk uh, in his workplace about the importance of encryption, data privacy, and all that. And it was very successful. And uh, they, the people there were engaged and, and they see the value. But the problem is they weren't, the, they weren't holding the budget. Because in order to run new initiatives, it's not just uh, fixing the problem, it's also uh, maintenance. There's a lot of cost that goes into uh, devoting man hours to purchasing uh, systems and, and certificates for this. And so nothing could happen. This was another failure. But again, he wasn't giving up. He knew this was important, and so he took it to another level. He thought, if I can't, if there's no one with authority to do this, I'm going to go all the way to the top. And so he he grabs like five minutes with the CEO as he's walking through the hallway and says, hey, I have something really important to tell you. And he talks to him about encryption and why this needs to be important to the company. And fortunately, he was able to convince him that this was a, a, a mission worth accomplishing. But that's really not the end, right? That was just one simple task that he needed to accomplish. There's a continual improving process that needs to happen for this to be a, a healthy program. Thankfully, though, by this process, he was able to engage with people all across the organization and get their trust and rapport so that when, he, when new things come, they're more engaged to help with that continual iteration. And they might even start to contribute. They might find their own vulnerabilities and uh, feed into the cycle. But what about outside your uh, organization? There's a lot of opportunity outside your organization to share the responsibility of your security program. So when you're implementing uh, your end solutions, there's basically two options, right? You can go to the cloud or you can go on-premise. And on-premise has a huge uh, perceived value of control because it's yours. It's your servers, it's your building, it's your room, it's your people in engaging with that, right? And so there's a, there's a feeling of safety. And, 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 that, and that's true. There's a lot of value to that. And so you feel like you're building out this fortress with your, with your data. The problem is, if you're managing it yourself, you also have to have safeguards against all of the disasters that come. Not only data breaches and hackers, but also natural disasters like hurricanes and fires and floods. So then you start building out all these protections for this, right? Like... Um, a whole camera system, a, a security patrol team, biometric locks, everything to protect from everything. And you start to raise the cost of maintenance and eventually things start breaking down because this isn't your, your main objective. This isn't what your company does. You have other things that you're trying to accomplish and you're just trying to make it happen through this means. And this is where the cloud can be very helpful. A lot of times the, the, the cloud providers uh, they've made a business out of uh, accomplishing this. And so they have state-of-the-art processes and procedures to keep things safe, uh, for not only from natural disasters, but also from uh, malicious attackers. But don't worry, you don't have to move 100% to the cloud in order to share this responsibility. You can do a hybrid approach. You can do cloud and on-premise, whatever works for your uh, company. So this is the concept of shared responsibility, not taking everything on yourself or your security team, but sharing it across the organization and even outside. The second goal is humanizing controls. When we look at the three primary factors that go into, uh, uh, or root causes, I should say, that go into an incident, you have malicious attacks, human errors, and system glitches. Of these three um, causes, it kind of break down into two categories, indirect control of the threat and direct control. Although we need to be looking at everything and be trying to mitigate everything, we should probably focus first on what we have the most control of. 
That, that, that way we can have the most impact. And this is the, the, the people, the humans, and they deserve the extra care. But humans are really good at some things and really bad at others. For example, something that um, humans are, are incredible at is problem solving. Just take, for example, how long it's taking for us to have fully autonomous cars, taking years to get there and tons of data uh, to train the systems. Whereas humans, we can learn how to drive in a matter of weeks or months if we devote our time to it. But something that humans are really bad at is our memory. We've all had that experience where we're with some friends or family and someone starts sharing a story. And halfway through the story, you chime in because you realize, oh, that's not how the story went. It went like this. And then as you start sharing your side, someone else comes in and says, oh, no, it went like this. And our memories are really actually cor corrupt. We, we can't trust fully in you know, a memory from uh, however long ago. But computers are different. Computers uh, store information in a different way than humans, and so they're much more trustworthy in terms of memory. So what does this mean for uh, our business analyst? During his journey uh, working through the encryption process, he uh, was sitting alongside uh, the engineer, and he noticed as he logged into the, the code base with his uh, credentials, his password was only five uh, characters long. And so he brought it up to the engineer, and the engineer said, yeah, but I have to remember a long password. That's super annoying. I have to type it all in. I have to remember unique passwords for every system. And it just got too much, and it was wasting time, so I just shortened it. And this was kind of interesting to the, to the analyst because he knew there was a policy on this. He knew there was a policy for password management and that it was clearly stated that it needed to be a certain amount of characters, a certain amount of randomization. But somehow this didn't engage uh, the, the engineer. So he had an idea. What if he implemented a, a password manager? This way, the engineer just remembered one password, and he could store randomly the other passwords to the other systems inside of that manager. And that way, he could have strong passwords everywhere and not have to remember all of them. Another option, and maybe both would be ideal, is to work with the system administrators to put in mandatory password uh, policies into the system level, not just on the policy level. That way, you, you, you leave out the room for, for error. So that's the humanized controls. We have to engage with the human factor in our organizations and build controls based on that. The third goal is uh, to have integrated prevention. Anything that's on the peripheral of our core systems is easily forgettable. The SDLC is a good example, uh, software development life cycle. We have our core process. We're planning, putting things uh, into code, testing, building, all the way through and repeating multiple times. And often if, if security doesn't have a, a deep enough root in the organization, we just add it as um, kind of detours to the process. Maybe in a, in a severe case, like a major release, we start to inject um, security measures. But on the little ones, we don't really care too much, and we're easily forgetting them. So as an example, um, the business analyst heard that they, the bank was creating a new app. And um, it was about six months in the works, and he was just hearing about it now. They're starting to involve people at the UAT uh, stage. And so he started asking questions. OK, how's the encryption? How are you hosting it? What kind of connections are you making to other services? Do you have a privacy policy in place, firewalls, uh, data rules? And as he asked these questions, he realized that this was not a security-first application. And it was very prone to, um, to uh, data breaches or hackers. But he was in a tough spot at this point because he could either uh, enforce that the fixes be made or allow things to proceed and uh, knowingly release security holes. If he in, uh, pushes for the fixes to be made, he's going to make some enemies, right? The project's going to get delayed. It's going to get up to this key stakeholders. They're going to get frustrated and come down, and then he's going to be the bad guy. On the other side, he would willingly release and uh, know about releasing security vulnerabilities into production. So because it's, he's knowing about this uh, so late in the process, he's put in a very difficult place. Ideally, 
this security planning would happen as early on in, this, in the process as possible, ideally even first. This way, security gets integrated into the entire process and it becomes a security first uh, effort, not a security when you can effort. The next goal is uh, to automate processes. I'm gonna go over this quick because I think we all realize the value that automation brings. We've all had experiences, whatever team it is, automation is critical. It brings action, especially when it's put into the right place at the right time. A couple good examples of uh, well-placed automation is um, in our alerting systems. So if we're thinking about quota management, making sure we don't run out of memory, CPU, storage. We want to make sure that the, the right people know about this uh, as soon as possible so they can deal with the issue. Another good example is uh, in our document management system. I don't know if, if any of you are involved in kind of the ISMS or information security management system. This is usually the, the system in your organization that handles uh, the process and audit side of the security program. If you're involved in this at all, you know that there's tons of documentation that go into a healthy security program. You're taking uh, screenshots and logs for evidence. You're creating calendar events for reminders. You're creating tons of to-dos. Um, and any anything you can do to automate this process will, one, save you money because you're gonna have less people, uh, you, you only need less people to perform the same actions, and um, it'll improve effectiveness across the organization. The fourth goal, actually the fifth goal, uh, is to focus on business objectives. As any operation within your organization, we have to think about the ROI. We can't just do things because we think they would be good, we have to have tangible uh, information about how this is gonna bring value, how this investment is gonna bring back something to us. Even thinking about our business analysts that talk to the CEO, in order for that conversation to be effective, he needs to bring uh, a value proposition to that executive to get sponsorship. That's how he accomplished it. And that's the same for security. We have to be thinking about uh, bringing the right value when it comes to defending the security program within your organization. One tactic is uh, to scare them, which is actually what I used earlier in this, uh, in this talk. And that's a very uh, real and um, effective approach. There's a lot of danger out there and we have to take it seriously. But there's also a lot of benefits to the security program that help to further and grow our organization. One example is the increase in sales opportunities. Most customers will have, um, will have a baseline requirements for their security. And if we don't meet those requirements, we could easily be out of the equation when it comes to that procurement process. As well, we have to think about uh, our competition. If we're in a bid and the, our competitor has a better security program, easily the customer could go with them instead of us. We also can't under, under, as underestimate the emotional impact of a good security program. When we deliver a real uh, secure environment for our, our customers, this gives them a feeling of safety and of confidence in us as a partner, as a vendor. And in the end, this will enhance the, the customer satisfaction and then also improve the bottom line for renewals and, uh, and add-ons. So how do we prioritize? I would suggest that you start with one. There's a lot of things you could start moving on. There's a lot of priorities you could address, but start with the one that makes the most sense for you. For example, if um, it makes the most sense to focus on the sales opportunities, maybe going after a publicly respected certification would be beneficial. That way your sales team can have uh, easier conversations with prospects about what the security program looks like, uh, what standards you're upholding to, instead of having to know all the nitty gritty details. 
But in the end, your security program should reflect your company. It needs to follow your needs, your priorities, and your timeline. It's important not to get distracted. Again, there's so many factors that feed into telling us what we should be working on and what not, but at the end of the day, it needs to come from you. So don't forget about focusing on business objectives. And just to close, I wanna kind of circle back to Equifax. That $1.4 billion mistake. And the thing is, it was preventable. This is a quote from uh, the US House of Representatives Committee that under, underwent the audit for, for this incident. They said, Equifax failed to implement an adequate security program to protect the sensitive data. As a result, allowing one of the largest data breaches in US history, such a breach was entirely preventable. And the thing is, it wasn't just preventable for Equifax. It's always preventable with the right controls in place. So what are you doing inside of your organization to make this happen? I hope that these goals uh, are a helpful guide to see how to improve uh, and how to create a holistic security program from sharing responsibility to humanizing controls, integrating processes, automating procedures, and focusing on real business objectives. But don't forget to also celebrate. Sometimes security can get you down and it's a little bit scary and it's a little bit intimidating, but make sure every step along the way, as you improve the program, as you make strides in the right direction, celebrate with your team and rejoice in uh, the, the movement that's happening. Thank you so much.